Chris Bukowski for the American Battlefield Trust, and I am standing on top the hill of death. I'm on Champion Hill, part of uh, Grant's inland campaign to take Vicksburg, and we are following in his footsteps. We are high atop the highest point here on this battlefield, which is going to be the most important battle of the Vicksburg campaign. I've heard historians say it is the most important battle of the entire Civil War because of the way it leads to the eventual capitulation of Vicksburg, which of course is a major turning point in the overall war. I'll let you talk about that for yourself, but there is a case that could be made. Joining me here on top of the Hill of Death is my great friend and partner, Chris White for the American Battlefield Trust. Chris, welcome to Champion Hill. Hey, welcome to Champion Hill. This was a trek of epic proportions to get here. So if you're coming to Champion Hill, where the trust has saved 869 acres to date, and we're filming this in 2023, I'm gonna tell you the road systems out here are from 1863. The potholes will swallow your car, the millings on the road. It's a rough place to get to, so. It's like the road just disappeared at one point and just turned into something that was not road. <laughs> well, I think we fell into a pothole, which took us to Narnia. And then we came back up into the area of Mississippi. But um, I, you really do. Just cautioning you, we're only joking a little bit. It was. It took us a while to get here. There was a bridge that was washed out. We had some some issues. I felt like Grant trying to get it, make his way up towards here. Bad Civil War joke there. <laughs> but before we really talk about what happened here, um, I, I just want to uh, kind of orient you. We're kind of looking towards the north where we're, we're standing here. And the Jackson Road would have run down from Jackson, Mississippi, the state capital. Jackson is off to the east of where we're standing here. It's about a 25-minute-ish ride from where we are in the car. Or depending on which road you take, it could take two days if you get swallowed up. Uh, but we have Jackson not too far from us. We have Vicksburg, which is out to the west of us. Uh, Vicksburg is uh, a good 30-ish um, minute drive from Champion Hill on a good day. So we're roughly between the two uh, cities here in this portion of, of Mississippi. F folks might be able to hear the so railroad to to, off yeah. in the distance there, and that's going to be the same railroad that the Federals are going to then follow out from Jackson toward Vicksburg in their pursuit of the Confederates. Yeah, th that's a, a great point, Chris, because we have the railroad that would run from initially Vicksburg to Clinton, and then eventually from Vicksburg all the way out to Jackson as it's extended on, and that's one of those spines of the Confederacy. So it's a great uh, uh, sound effect out here, which we're not adding in ourselves. But this would have brought the uh, Union Army of the Tennessee to this point, the Jackson Road, as well as a few other roads. So we'll talk about those and we'll visit a crossroads as we cut from here and go down to uh, another portion of the battle. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But <laughs> to get us to this point, in the Vicksburg campaign, um, we have battled along the river with David Glasgow Farragut, and we've battled along the river with David Dixon Porter. We've run the guns of Vicksburg twice, and if you haven't seen our Fort Hill video, check that out. That sets up the entire campaign for us. And now we have moved south with the Federal Army along the Louisiana border, down the Mississippi River, where we eventually will cross at a place called Bruinsburg. And now General Grant is on our side of the river, the Mississippi River. And now Grant is going to move north, northeast. He is going to cut cross country using uh, a road system that will bring him into places like Jackson, Raymond, uh, Port Republic, um, and other places like that that you'll see along the way. Um, so we're going to have a large number of, of battlefields that are going to take place or battles are going to take place. So we'll go to places like Grand Gulf where there was a, a naval battle as well as some, some uh, infantry action. We have all kinds of really cool battles that will take place. Um, not so cool if you're in them, but some cool places to visit, I should say. So as we move up through here, Grant is going to start battling his way. Uh, in early May, and he's going to make towards the capital of Jackson. And the idea is to seal off Jackson, Mississippi from Vicksburg. We're going to make it essentially landlocked uh, from the rest of the Confederacy, utilizing the river uh, to hold, hold one side of the city. And we'll have the United States Navy do that for us. We'll put gunboats in the river. And then coming in from this side will be the United States Army. Their job is to go up into Jackson, destroy the capital and potentially engage with another Confederate army. We have one over in Vicksburg under the command of John Pemberton 
and another over in Jackson under the command of Joseph Eggleston Johnston. Johnston will arrive in Jackson, I believe, for about 24 hours. He'll show up. You're he'll, being generous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he'll show up. He'll kind of look around and he'll say, whoop, got to go. <laughs> and he heads out, out with his army of relief that was supposed to help out John Pemberton's 35,000 or so men at Vicksburg. Johnston actually takes off with a force of about 25,000 men and heads to the north, north of Jackson. In the meantime, into the city of Jackson will come Union forces and they will uh, devastate the city. And then they will turn following the railroad as well as some other roads towards where we're standing. And when Johnson first arrives in Jackson, he starts sending a really confusing and conflicting orders to Pemberton. Pemberton has been ordered by Johnson to preserve his army. But, he's, but Pemberton has also been ordered by Jefferson Davis to preserve Vicksburg. So these conflicting orders really put Pemberton in a tough spot. And then he suddenly gets these orders from Johnson, who has shown up on the scene. He has been hunkered down in Tullahoma for months before this, and he starts showing up and offering orders. And Johnson says, I'm going to stay in Jackson, and I want you to sneak up behind the Federals, and we're going to catch him in a pincer movement. I'll be the anvil, you be the hammer. And then he leaves Jackson and doesn't tell Pemberton he's leaving. So as Pemberton's trying to make sense of his conflicting orders, all these confusing messages from Johnston, which fall into Grant's hands, by the way, because of a spy who's one of those couriers, um, Pemberton leaves part of his force in Vicksburg, but then sallies forth with part of his force, but then isn't sure what to do with them. And eventually, after a really confusing council of war, he'll decide rather than to go after, uh, after Grant, he's going to try to sever Grant's supply lines. By that point, Grant has su severed his own supply lines. So Pemberton's wandering around, off in the wilderness, off to my right, to Chris's left, and uh, finally decides to head back toward Edwards Station. And it's as he is making his way back toward Edwards, out of the wilderness, that he's going to stumble into Grant, who has gotten this copy of the orders that uh, the spy intercepted. And Grant's going to come out to try to find Pemberton, who has left the safety of his fortifications, doesn't know where he's going or what he's doing, and Grant's going to look for that opportunity to pounce. And I think I said Port Republic earlier. I meant Port Gibson. There are a lot of, there's Port Hudson, Port Gibson, Port Republic, lots of ports in the Civil War, and I meant Port Gibson. So uh, I just wanted to back up and, and correct that. That's one of the battles on the way up to uh, where we're standing. So uh, to give you an idea of what's happening now, um, and I'm holding our Western map books for a reason, because yes, I'm going to promote it, but I also want to show you something here. To give you an idea, we have, uh, if we have our map, we'll call this Vicksburg, we'll call this Jackson, and then down here is where Bruinsburg uh, sits or sat because it's a defunct town now. And what Grant will do is start to move up in this direction, keeping himself between Vicksburg and the rest of the Confederacy. That's going to be the idea. He is going to try to isolate the city of about 4,000 people at this point, and the idea will be to eventually double back encircle the city from the landward side, and then use the Navy on this side. As Chris mentioned, we had Johnston over here in Jackson, and Johnston goes this way, just about that fast, to get out of, out of harm's way. Uh, but what Pemberton wanted to do, and Johnston wanted to do, was to let Grant come up to this point between my two fists, and then slam between them. That's, that's the whole idea out here. But you have to have willing <laughs> willing people to come out here, willing, not subordinates in this case, but bosses to come out here and help. And as Chris pointed out, Vicksburg was the key to many people. And Jefferson Davis, the commander in chief of the Confederate armies, is going to tell, uh, you know, Pemberton, hold at all costs, where Johnston's like, you better get out of Dodge. Like he's getting all these conflicting, these conflicting um, orders. So what Pemberton decides to do is march about 25,000 men out of the city of Vicksburg. And he is going to start to move towards the east. He leaves two divisions behind to help defend the city in case he needs to fall back. That can also act as a reserve if he's successful out here, which we know he is not. Uh, but he could potentially move, uh, call on reinforcements. Now, when this happens, Grant is just elated because he's going to find out that Pemberton has now come out from behind his works 
to give him battle. This is exactly what we see in 1864 when he's trying to, Grant is, is trying to defeat Robert E. Lee's forces in northern and central Virginia. He wanted Lee in the open. Now Pemberton gave him exactly what he wanted here in May of 1863. So by the time the Federals are done dealing with Jackson, they are now going to start to turn all three of the Corps, the 13th, 15th, and 17th Corps, in our direction, approximately 70-ish thousand men. And their jobs are to come into this direction and now try to destroy Pemberton's forces. If they can destroy Pemberton's forces or rout them outside of the fortifications, the Vicksburg campaign is essentially over. And all Grant has to do is march into the city of Vicksburg, seize that city, and that's it. The, the game is up for, for Pemberton. Well, Pemberton, this is really his first field command. It's 1863, he's a lieutenant general, which means he has three stars, and now Pemberton is going to call out his divisions to march out here into a field of battle to take on Grant, who has been leading armies since 1861. Uh, and it's just not an equation for, for success. And I would say that, you know, to anyone. I mean, most of the Civil War generals have never commanded more than 120 men in their lives before the war. And now here's Pemberton in over his head. Chris, anything to add at this point? Well, so as Pemberton's trying to grope his way across the uh, countryside, he knows that he's got Grant hot on his heels. He's going to actually position Stephen Dill Lee up on the top of this hill because it's a high spot that gives him a good view of the entire countryside. And Dill's going to be the one who sees that Yankees are coming. And so that's going to then alert Pemberton to try to set up some sort of defensive position so that he can protect the roads that he needs to get his army all the way back. Um, he was not expecting to run into Grant out here at all. And when Grant bumps into him, it's a mad panic to try to get his army consolidated and back toward Vicksburg. He needs that road system that we've talked about in order to do that. So when he sets up his defensive cordon, he's going to do so in order to protect the roads that's going to allow his men to get together and get to the west. Yeah, and, and uh, we're on Champion Hill, and this is almost like Champion Cliff, if you ask me. I mean, you can walk up the one side, and it feels like, okay, it's a little bit of a, a hike, but when you look straight down on the north face or the west face of it, I mean, it is straight down. This is a, um, a hill over time that erosion's been, been you know, chipping away at, and we see this out here in Vicksburg a lot. And there was also a gravel operation out here after the battle, and uh, as our friend Tim Smith has said, there are parts of Champion Hill spread all across this country because they literally just scooped it away and sent it off. And that erosion Chris has talked about has made it even worse, so it looks really precipitous, but this was a high commanding position once upon a time. Yeah, this was the highest point around. Um, Sid and Matilda, uh, Sid and Matilda Sorry, Champion owned the hill. They uh, had their house not uh, not far from here, which is burned by Union soldiers during the war. Uh, Sid uh, actually passed away at the age of 45. He's wounded at the Battle of Nashville, I believe. He's a Confederate lieutenant colonel um, in charge of a, a Mississippi Cav Regiment, and he's wounded in the neck, and he never fully recovers from that wound. Um, but the Champion family actually owned Champion Hill. For, uh, I think it's, we're on Sid Champion the seventh now. Um, and they're great friends of the American Battlefield Trust. Dare I say they are champions of preservation? Ah, well played, sir. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, this is a, a very important battle here. And some historians said this is the most important battle of the war. Some say the, of the campaign. Some say this is a turning point in, in the war because this is where Grant is able to really isolate Pemberton from the rest of the Confederacy. And he really is able to start pushing forward and initiate those siege operations. So to get to that this point, I'm going to encourage you to, to invest in our Battle Maps of the American Civil War, Volume 2. Um, this is our Western campaign book. And we have uh, laid out the major battlefields that we've preserved land upon. And I wanted to use this map. And this one is even a little bit out of date by the point this has come out. But just to show you the amount of land that has now been preserved here at Champion Hill. In fact, the National Park Service is taking over parts of, of uh, the Champion Hill Battlefield. The Coker House is now a National Park Service site. Um, we'll take you down to the crossroads. If you walk up here from the crossroads, uh, you'll actually notice National Park Service signs. So this is absolutely a very vital um, uh, battlefield. You can see there's a lot of action that took place here, and we'll break that down here for you in a second. But the reason they come through this area, Champion Hill, is a high commanding point on this map that you see here. 
and it will lead you from Jackson along the Jackson Road and will go along a part of the historic road trace, which is just below us, not too far from where we're standing. And that would take you down to the intersection of the middle road, which we came in on, which actually had the only road cones that we saw to caution you of any of the roads as you come through here. And I question, Chris, what does it take to get a road cone out on this road? The whole road should have been lined with cones. <laughs> and then, and we've been here before. This isn't our first time. And here's the Ratliff Road, which will take you down to the Ratliff Plantation, which sat right down here where you see the name William Wing Loring. And we'll put this map up here a little bit more clearly for you um, so that you can see this uh, on the screen. But what happens is, is Pemberton, is going to deploy his three divisions on roughly a three mile front uh, on a ridge line facing out towards the east, facing out off in that direction. Unfortunately, he for him, he left you know two of his divisions behind, which was a prudent decision in Vicksburg. But he's unable to have a, a, uh, a great reserve of troops ready to move at a moment's notice, left or right. And he doesn't have a large number of troops to deploy uh, off to his north or his left to help defend, better defend the Jackson Road. And I'll say of those division commanders that are out with them, he's got old blizzards, uh, William Loring, who he doesn't like, doesn't like him. So there's going to be, and we'll see as this battle unfolds, a little bit of insubordination. He's got John Bowen, who is young uh, and, and new to division command. He's got Stevenson. So we've got three division commanders, two of whom could be questionable under fire, under a commander who has never led troops in the field before. Yeah, and, and I would add, um, you know, William Wing Loring is the most senior uh, in the old army, William Wing Loring actually outranked Robert E. Lee. Um, and people say, who is this William Wing Loring guy? Well, Loring served in the Eastern Theater. In fact, he served in the um, uh, Texas Revolution uh, for a very, very brief time when his parents came and got him and brought him back to back home to Florida. Um, he serves in the Seminole Wars. He serves in the Mexican-American War. In fact, he's part of the Mormon Wars, uh, the Camel Expedition. He's in charge of the United States... Um, uh, mounted uh, infantry prior to the war, and he lost an arm, I think it's at Buena Vista at, during the Mexican-American War, and um, if that's wrong, I'm working without a net here, so you're using Google. On the edge of a cliff, On no the less. edge of a cliff, and he would use, he would uh, say, give them blizzards, give them blizzards, was his nickname, <laughs> Old Blizzards, because he would say that going into battle. Uh, he en ends up going to the Egyptian army after the war, um, and Loring ran afoul of Robert E. Lee early in the war, as well as Stonewall Jackson. If you ever heard of the Romney expedition, um, William Wing Loring was one of the leaders of the revolt of Jackson's generals whenever they were saying this old crazy old Presbyterian fool shouldn't be in charge of an army. Uh, Loring eventually gets shipped out to the Western Theater where he kind of makes a nuisance of himself from time to time and it'll happen here. Um, John Bowen, a West Point graduate, I believe of the class of 53 or 54. He also went to the University of Georgia. Um, he's 32 years old. He's the youngest division commander here on the battlefield. And then you have Carter Stevenson of Fredericksburg, Virginia, who is um, who's, uh, out here as well. So we have two West Pointers and, and uh, Loring, who's not a West Pointer, but he has a lot of combat experience. Uh, so you would think that things would potentially go well, but, but Pemberton is in over his head. He's outnumbered, he's outpositioned, and now what will happen to start to bring us to our story of where we're standing, um, the Federals will start to push in upon him, and he's going to be dealing with uh, James Birdsey McPherson's corps as well as um, 13th Corps. John, John McLernan. Thank you, John McLernan. <laughs> Coming in down here on yep. the south. So you have uh, McLaren coming down here um, towards the Coker House, which I think, yep, there it is right here. Um, and you'll see the name Tillman, Lloyd Tillman. He's killed in action here. And then we have the, the Confederates who will place cannon up on top of this hill for cannon. Um, and that battery, which is of Alabama guns, will actually be captured up here uh, by the uh, federal divisions coming up into this area. This is very much what we would consider a seesaw battle. Stephen D. Lee will see that this this position is actually undefended at one point because Loring, I'm sorry, Loring, Pemberton doesn't have enough men to actually extend to this point and then eventually the Confederates will come up here, make sure they put a battery, get some infantry up here, but they are swept off the hill. And it's a pretty ferocious hand-to-hand -hand fight at the foot of this hill. Um, Alvin Hovey's 
uh, brigades, the first two uh, to get into action. Logan deploys on his right. They come forward at a big charge, and down at the base of this hill, it gets nasty. Yeah. And the federal weight just kind of pushes and pushes and up over this crest, as, as, as Chris said, and then back toward that vital crossroads that Pemberton's trying to defend, and now he's lost his best piece of high ground from which to do that. Yeah, and, and uh, it's going to take a number of counterattacks for the Confederates to take back this hill, um, which will eventually be taken back by the Federals, uh, who will be victorious, given away the end of the story. Um, at one point, uh, Frank Cockrell, leading the Missouri Brigade, comes up here, and Cockrell allegedly is carrying a sword in one hand and a magnolia flower in the other. Very, very uh, fitting to be in the Mississippi, uh, state of Mississippi, the Magnolia State, to come up here and fight. Um, I sometimes wonder what these guys are actually carrying into battle. You know, I just happen to have a magnolia in my pocket. Yeah, is it true? Is it not? I mean, I can see it. I mean, I can see Jeb Stewart doing that out in the East. Um, but um, this, this is a very nasty fight, as Chris pointed out. And it will be a seesaw action throughout the day. I mean, this is a battle that goes back and forth quickly. Um, and the main problem that Pemberton has is he has too few men. He has another problem, a little lesser problem, and that is that Johnston is not coming in from the rear to apply pressure like he was supposed to. He has to now fight for his life, the life of his army, because he has to get out of here. With the Federals coming in, sweeping in on his left flank and sweep, sweeping him downwards, he has to keep the road to Edwards open. He also has to keep open his line of retreat all the way back to Vicksburg along the uh, Southern Railroad, as well as the Jackson Road. He has to make sure that he can uh, get out of Dodge. And Champion Hill, once it falls to the Federals, could give them a, a commanding position and also keep giving the Federals the initiative to keep pushing on. So what we need to do is keep our initiative and keep pushing on and head down to the bottom of this hill and talk about the, the action that took place down at the intersection and talk more about uh, the Battle of Champion Hill. Chris, anything to add before we head off? I think we're about to be swept from the crest of this hill by the Federals. All right. We'll see you in a moment. We'll see you at the bottom. And now we're magically down at the crossroads of Champion Hill. I mean, it was whew, a long walk. It actually was. Uh, it's a little muddy up here, so if you ever come up to Champion Hill, which I encourage you to do. I mean, we've, we've uh, preserved a large number of acres up here, 869. If you go over to Raymond Battlefield, which is just down the road from us, and it's a fantastic um, battlefield park that our friend Parker Hills helps to uh, coordinate and oversee. They have recreated cannon down there, and they really tell the, the story of Raymond. If you put the two battlefields together, we preserve more than a thousand acres just in this small area um, out, out where we are. And on two important battles of the um, inland campaign, as Tim Smith calls us, for the Vicksburg campaign. But, you know, pointing off towards uh, uh, the north and Champion Hill was in that direction. We actually came walking down from that direction um, towards the camera. Uh, you can see how muddy it gets, and that goes up the old Jackson Road Trace. So we're down here at the old intersection. I wanted to correct something I said earlier um, that uh, I said uh, Grain had 77,000 men, and I was putting in my head the Vicksburg campaign. That's what he'll have during the siege later on. At this point, he has 33 to 35,000 men, um, and John Pemberton's army has 23 to 25,000 men. So I just wanted to make sure I corrected that. I'm sure plenty of you have already corrected me in the comments, but uh, thank you for, for helping. And then there's uh, Joe Johnson's Army of Relief, which has not yet really coalesced. Pemberton doesn't know him, how many guys are out there. Grant doesn't know how many guys are out there, but that phantom army is really going to lurk in the back of uh, Grant's head. At this point, if everybody could get scraped together, Johnson's got maybe uh, eight, 10,000 guys, depending on how far along the railroad tracks are. They're not really a factor, except that they do drive some of Grant's decision making. Yeah, and I will say that the numbers are subjective during this war throughout many campaigns. I've seen the number as high as 25,000 for Johnston's men. Does that mean he has as many in the field? Probably not. That's under his operational control at some point. So, I mean, it's, it's put it this way, Bob Crick always said he hated working with numbers because everybody had a different number, and that's true. Um, so we're down here now at the crossroads, and this would have been a, a crossroads out in the country just like it is today. And the middle road, would run right down here where the good old Bighorn is sitting. Um, and this would bring, <coughs> from the direction that you're looking, that would bring in the Federal Infantry. Off to my right, that's the old Jackson Road coming down to this area. And then if we swing around, you'll see DJ Johnson Road. That is uh, the Ratliff, 
Ratliff uh, Plantation Road. Today it's a dead end, but that would lead you all the way down to the Coker House, um, which would take you down to the Raymond Road. So there's a number of roads coming through here. Uh, today the middle road's called Billy Field Road. So this is the intersection that we would talk about. And if you're going to access the Champion Hill Battlefield, and I encourage you to head over to battlefields.org and learn more about our Vicksburg campaign app that we have. It's free. It can bring you right out to places like this, and you can use our maps like we have in our map book, dun, dun, dun. Um, as well as uh, uh, videos of a uh, good friend and former park historian at Vicksburg, uh, Terry Wenchel. Um, you can come out here and visit this site. Um, there are a number of markers and monuments that are out here, not all to the battle, um, but you'll notice that this was a, na a National uh, Historic Register in 1977. This site, this is one of the, the markers that was placed out here, and this shows that it holds national significance. This is before, about a decade before, um, what the American Battlefield Trust was actually created, which was uh, around 1987, um, we were created, so about a decade before. We have a, a, a marker over here talking about John Bowen and his counterattack. This is uh, probably Bowen, and my estimation is, is the finest division commander here in the Vicksburg campaign for Pemberton's army. I think um, that's a, a very important uh, role, and John Bowen will die of dysentery uh, shortly after the Vicksburg campaign ends. Um, and then down here, we have another sign, and these are all relatively new. We have 2013, 2017, another one up the hill or two. They're 2018, 2012. Um, this one talks about the fight for the crossroads. So as you're coming down through here, um, this would be the area that you would stop. You would park, learn more about what is happening down here at Champion Hill. You can park your car off to the side of the road and take that walk up to Champion Hill. And probably most importantly to uh, preservationists and to Civil War fans, as we cross the road here, we'll see a monument that was placed here uh, back in 2018 to Ed Bars, who was the former uh, historian at Vicksburg National Military Park. He uh, also helped to find the USS Cairo. And if you're a, a um, Civil War buff, you're gonna know Ed's name. And this was placed out here um, uh, a few years before Ed passed away. And uh, it sits out here at the crossroads, which was an appropriate place because he's very important to the Vicksburg campaign and loved to bring bring uh, tour groups out here. In fact, Terry Winchell was telling us a story uh, the other day about bringing a tour group out here. Um, and Ed pulled the bus off the side of the road. It had been pouring all day and everyone soaked to the bone. And Ed decided he was gonna get off the bus here and bring everyone um, out here and stand for an hour and talk to them. Well, Ed gets off the bus, Terry gets off the bus. None of the tour participants would get off the bus. They're already soaked. So Ed, stood on the side of the road out here, screaming through the door to tell folks about the Champion Hill battle. And then Terry Winchell will actually stand out there holding up signs to show um, what's going on. Now, because of those roads that Chris mentioned a few minutes ago, this area uh, is really key for Pemberton as he's trying to get his army consolidated and off to Vicksburg. And so having this intersection, and let me turn around here and face it, um, this intersection here is really key. So Pemberton is going to try to organize a counterattack to sweep back up through here. And he's gonna send Bowen's division in. And uh, Bowen is gonna actually have a fantastic time. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, he's probably the finest fighter that Pemberton has at his disposal. He's seen some fighting already uh, down at uh, Port Gibson, um, and uh, he's gonna prove himself invaluable here. He's gonna be successful in that counterattack and then push back up to the hill, the crest of the hill, and the Federals are gonna find themselves again on that piece of high spot. And then it's gonna be Grant's turn to then throw in a counterattack, and that's gonna then seesaw back to this area as well. So we're gonna see, <laughs> we're gonna see lots of back and forth for control of this intersection. Now, as the Federals finally secure this position, uh, we left old Blizzards down on the lower road and he's gonna find himself suddenly facing an advance from uh, John McClernand. We can see them down there uh, in that direction there. McClernand is actually the first person to make contact here. He led, uh, because of his position when the armies were in Jackson, he led the advance out in this direction. Uh, but all the main fighting is gonna be happening up here as he gets more of his men onto this battlefield. Um, 
Pemberton's really going to find himself in dire straits, and so he's going to leave behind the brigade of Tillman to try to stall any advance and pursuit as he gets the rest of his army off this field. But Loring is going to find himself cut off, and he's going to march away and not tell Pemberton. And as a result, Pemberton will waste time waiting at the Big Black River the next day, and we might go take a look out there. Um, and as he's waiting for Loring, that allows Grant to uh, close in on him again. So uh, Tillman's defense to try to slow down Grant's pursuit and McClernand's pursuit here is going to prove effective and allow Pemberton to get off Champion Hill. It's going to cost Tillman his life. He will be disemboweled by an artillery shell. There's a monument to him alongside the road down there. But uh, Pemberton's army is going to be able to get to the Big Black where then they stop. Rather than getting all the way into the Vicksburg defenses where they might find safety, they're really going to try to wait and hope for Loring to catch up, and he's not going to. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for uh, stepping in. And uh, you never know what you're going to do when you're shooting a video did out you, there. Did you get that fellow to where he needed to be? I, I did. He was actually showing me the Time Life Civil War series that he's reading <laughs> and working on. But um, uh, to close up here, yeah, Lloyd Tillman, uh, just to mention, there is a monument down along um, today, the Raymond Road. But there's also a monument, a more elaborate monument, oh, in oh. Vicksburg National Military Are Park. you going to reenact it first? Uh, the... Oh, looks like that. I mean, <laughs> his horse is kind of looks like in his death row. He's doing this big thing. It's it's a wonderful monument. It's huge. It's it's probably as Tim Smith said. I'm not sure someone would look like that if they were disemboweled by a by a shell. But it's pretty nonetheless. Is how he put it. To what we were talking about it. Um, but uh, a Tillman, it does cost Tillman his life. And you know the the battle at Champion Hill ends at um, late in the day on May the sixteenth, and that leaves Grant firmly in control of the Vicksburg campaign. Um, the losses out here uh, for the Confederates will be staggering. I mean, they have more than 2,000 missing and captured um, out here alone. There's demoralized men within that army. Um, one surgeon, I believe it was, said that, uh, you know, this army lacked initiative and leadership. Um, and he talked about John Pemberton and what he said was with three words, indecision, indecision, indecision. Um, and many of the Southerners looked upon John Pemberton, who's a West Point graduate of a class of 1838, I believe, um, and uh, it's 37 or 38. He's from Gwynedd Valley, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia. He's friends with George Gordon Meade. He's actually buried in Laurel Cemetery, uh, Laurel Hill Cemetery in, in Philadelphia. Not not far from Meade. Not far from Meade. And in fact, Meade said uh, he shouldn't be buried here because he was a traitor at one point. At least that was one of the stories that I had read. I'm not sure if that's 100% true or not. But regardless, uh, Pemberton's wife is from North Norfolk, Virginia. She's uh, a Southerner through and through and, and challenged her husband to become part of the Confederate Army. Um, when he does, he rises to the rank of Lieutenant General, um, and, but they're always looking at him sideways because he's a Pennsylvanian leading a Southern Army. You know, is this him being treacherous and backstabbing? Is he a traitor to the Southerners? You know, and, and that's, there's a lot of um, shells lobbed at him, uh, not not uh, literal not shells, not but just by the Yankees, but <laughs> but, but uh, literary shells written uh, by his men saying, is this guy a traitor to us? Is he a traitor to our cause? Um, and quite frankly, Pemberton's true to the Southern cause through and through. He's just not a great general. He's placed in a bad position after the Vicksburg campaign. Fast forwarding, of course, he, he uh, uh, is pretty much relieved to command because he doesn't have an army uh, and no one will give him another command for a lieutenant general, she, three stars. Uh, so he resigns from the Confederate Army only to rejoin as a lieutenant colonel. Um, and he'll be a lieutenant colonel of artillery and inspector in the Eastern Theater until the end of the Civil War. Um, and so this is a guy, in a way, who dies with no country because he uh, wasn't accepted by the former Philadelphia Society. Southerners looked uh, at him sideways for the rest of his life, thinking that he gave up Vicksburg on purpose. Um, and in fact, when he gets back to Vicksburg later on, uh, after Champion Hill and he starts to hear the rumblings, he's going to challenge his men to come and fight. And sh he's going to show them just how uh, much of a Southerner he truly is because he is going to lead them into action. And, of course, 47 days later, he surrenders the army. 
uh, um, at Vicksburg. And I think the one person we haven't talked about a lot too, as far as someone who bears responsibility for this loss is Joe Johnston. You know, we talked about how he showed up. He abdicates his responsibility by leaving Jackson, sends conflicting messages to Pemberton. Pemberton can't make heads or tails of that. Um, in the months in leading up to this campaign, uh, Johnston had made his headquarters in Tullahoma and had tried to pretend for all he was worth that he didn't have to be responsible for this theater of action. And he only comes out here because he is forced to by direct order from the War Department. And so uh, just because of that lack of responsibility in Johnson's part, uh, he really doesn't provide the sort of direct orders or guidance or firm hand that Pemberton really needs. Uh, he sets Pemberton up for failure, does a lot in his correspondence to try to cover his own butt. And then, of course, when Pemberton fails, Johnson's like, see, I told you so. That could have been me. Yeah, I think that uh, Jefferson Davis himself sums up Joe Johnston in one word, and that was written in the margin of a letter that was written to him in March of 1862 by Johnston himself. And Jefferson Davis, making notes in the margin, simply said, insubordinate. And I think that says everything we need to know about Joe Johnston. And for those of you who think Joe Johnston's a, uh, a great general, I want to know what you're drinking uh, and then send me a couple <laughs> gallons of that because Joe Johnston is one of the overrated generals of the American Civil War. He's a guy who time and time again fails at these high commands and constantly is placed back in, in, in the, the high command. Um, and there's some reasons for that. It's because he, you know, he's there, you know, and he's also a ranking general, but Joe Johnston, time and again will fail the Southern Confederacy. And this is the nadir of his career. Uh, in a career where he does not live up to expectations, this is absolutely where he bottoms out. Yeah, and, and left it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on, uh, keep campaigning with Ulysses S. Grant and the Army is here, and we're going to head down towards the Big Black River. Um, and we will uh, check out Vicksburg a little bit later on. But we encourage you to come out here to Champion Hill. It's without the support of preservationists um, and supporters of the American Battlefield Trust, we would not have 869 acres out here preserved. And we are really excited to share this story with you. We hope that you'll check it out on our app in our Western Maps book. Go over to battlefields.org and please hit that subscribe button here on YouTube and hit that bell notification and tell your friends and tell your family. Check out our website, check out our YouTube channel, Facebook page, and Instagram. On behalf of Chris Bukowski behind the camera, I'm Chris White. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.